I think it's safe to say that the average American cannot agree on very much these days. But if there's one thing that we can agree on, I would venture to say, is that all is not well in the world. There's a lot of brokenness in this world. There's a lot of things that are wrong in this world. You know, here we are, Christmas season in 2020, right in the thick of the restrictions, stay-at-home orders, closures, rising COVID cases, hospital ICUs, just overcapacity, in what is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. Such an irony, right? It doesn't feel like it's very run wonderful at all right now, but maybe it's for that very reason, and I believe this with all my heart, that this Christmas may be the most important one we've ever celebrated, the most significant one of all. So I'm glad that all of you and I can journey in this message together, that we're together today to hear this word. I pray that the power of God's word and the power of his promises will bring you a genuine, powerful renewal of hope in your lives, a newfound appreciation for Christmas and what it's all about. Now, let me say this, though. The title of today's message is a little different. It's called The Unfinished Story of Christmas. Now, that title may throw you off a little bit. You know, what's unfinished about Christmas? You know, it's a finished story, right? It's the story of Jesus's birth. And what's unfinished about that? Well, we'll, we'll find out uh, what that unfinished part of this story is in a little bit. But for now, I'd like to focus our attention on the part that we do know, on the part that is finished. And on that note, I'm going to invite our brother uh, Sam to read from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. All right. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translates to God with us. Thank you, Sam. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we can lose sight of how miraculous <laughs> and astounding these real historical events really are. It, what Sam just read, this is the only time in all of human history that a woman conceived a child supernaturally. Okay, it beyond any external factors whatsoever. It has never happened before that, and it will never happen again. This is the only time God himself gave a child to the womb of this young probably 14 or so year old girl named Mary. And of course, Joseph had no idea that this, would, this was a supernatural conception. That wouldn't even come to mind for him because that's impossible, right? That's unthinkable. And in light of this, Luke's gospel reveals that an angel actually appeared to Mary as well and declared to her before Jesus was born 
for nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. Now, given how unprecedented this situation was, God sent a message to Joseph in a very special way so he could get the message very clearly and powerfully. An angel appeared to him in a dream, declaring to him, you do not need to fear. Take Mary as your wife, because a child in her womb is not from the seed of man. She was not being unfaithful to you. This is a child from God himself. And that he was to be named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. If we took a poll asking, you know, random people off the street to say what we need salvation from the most in the world today, you can imagine the answers that we would get. Many would say we need salvation from serious matters. Of course, salvation from this pandemic or to be saved from social injustice or systemic racism or to be saved from unnecessary shutdowns that are harming business owners or the working class. Others might focus on maybe more trivial matters like Salvation from Zoom fatigue, or not being able to eat inside of a restaurant, or another abnormally windy day in Porter Ranch, or not being able to go to Universal Studios and ride Jurassic World. I know that that's a real pain in the heart of some of our, our teenagers, right? So many of us would say, over all else, forget anything else. If there's one thing I wish that we, a, a gift I wish I could have is, I just wish everything would get back to normal again. How many of us have said that, right? I know a lot of us have said that, okay? So don't lie. I know you guys, are like, oh, I wish, I wish we, we can just get back to normal again, right? Almost everyone has said that. Yeah, no matter what the answer, we'd all agree. Not all is well in the world. We'd all agree there's still a lot to be thankful for, of course. But there's a lot that's not right. Harsh realities that we wish could be changed or improved or redeemed. And we've been reminded of that all the more in 2020. But even if life got back to normal, if everything opened up again, if we could see each other and give each other high fives again, give each other hugs again, will all be well? There will still be a problem. There will still be many problems. There will still be the problem of human evil. There's still the problem of suffering. Still the problem and the reality of sickness and death. None of that will go away. You know, this pandemic we've been facing all years, it's not a new problem, really. It's just a magnification of the problems we've been facing since the beginning of time. And with this in mind, going back to what the angel declared to Joseph in naming his son Jesus, Joseph knew that this was, this name was the Greek translation of the Hebrew name Joshua, the name Yeshua which means the Lord saves. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. And as we read in verse 21, Christmas is a celebration that the Savior came into a broken and dying world, not to save us from societal or political problems or to save us from natural disasters or pandemics or diseases, because those are just the byproducts of a deeper problem. The real problem that Jesus came to save us from, unlike the ones I just listed, is not something outside of ourselves, right? The problem Jesus came to save us from is a problem that lies within. It's a problem we have no answer for. It's a problem that is literally impossible for human beings to solve because human beings are the problem. 
It's the problem of sin. Sin is the condition, uh, a spiritual de- disease with no human cure. It's the condition, the reality that human beings are born with an innate desire to be their own God. That's sin. We're born with this innate desire to have authority to choose for ourselves what we believe is good or evil, what we believe is wrong or right. And the only thing standing in the way of that is the existence of a higher authority than our own. And that is why we rebel against God. We rebel against God by either not believing he exists at all or by choosing to ignore his existence or by believing in some form of religion or spirituality that fits within our framework that still allows us to be the real authority over our own lives. Some call this state freedom, right? That's freedom. But God's word actually says that that's the exact opposite, that that's enslavement to sin, which blinds us to believe that we don't need God. But if there's one thing maybe this pandemic has revealed to us is that we're not powerful enough on our own to save ourselves. Even our healthcare system isn't powerful enough to save us. Our government isn't powerful enough to save us. Nothing is. There must be something more beyond ourselves. And that's what Jesus came to reveal. God's word makes clear that we're all sinners. We're under the condemnation of our sin and That blinds us to believe we don't need God. And if we remain in this state, the Bible declares that we will be forever separated from God in an eternity in hell. And to save us from that eternal separation, God did the unthinkable, the impossible, and became one of us so that he could pay the penalty for that sin on our behalf. And that's exactly what Jesus did some 33 years after his birth to fulfill the promise that that angel gave to Joseph that day before Jesus was even born, that his baby boy would one day save the world from sin. The coming of Jesus into the world The Christmas story reveals to all of humanity that what we need the most is God himself. What our hearts and souls are really longing for is to dwell with God, to be one with God. As we read in earlier uh, verses 22 and 23, the birth of Christ fulfilled that ancient promise In the Old Testament, what God spoke to the prophet Isaiah about 700 years before Jesus was even born, that prophecy, that promise to Israel and to us all that a virgin would give birth to a son who would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what we need the most. God with us. A couple of days ago, I was on a Zoom call uh, with uh, several of the deans at UCLA, you know, my other job. We're all reflecting on the year that has been for the UC system and for UCLA. One of the deans mentioned how he dislikes the term social distancing because it's really physical distancing that's necessary due to the pandemic, but not social distancing because human beings need community and support, even if they are virtual connections in these times. We need those connections. I was almost ready to give him an amen on that Zoom, but I don't know if that would have been necessarily appropriate in that context. But I think we'd all agree that we are all hardwired for relationships. 
We're all hardwired for connections, right? We value connections. We value relationships. We value family. We value friendships. It's part of our DNA. And the interesting thing about that is God created us in his image. And God is a God of community. He exists eternally in three persons. One God in three persons, right? Father, Son, and Spirit. Community is in the nature of God, and that's how he created us, in his image. We love community. We value community. He created humanity not because he had to. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Because he's, his nature is to extend his love beyond himself. That's the God that we worship. It's part of our DNA. We all need connections. But it also points to the reality that most of all, our human souls are longing for connection, oneness with God himself. That takes us to the unfinished part of the Christmas story. In a sense, Christmas is like a two-part story. We all know the first part. It's the part that we looked at already. It's, it's the promise. Part one, if you will, it's the promise of Christmas. And part two is the complete fulfillment of that promise, right? Part one, you could say, was the prelude. And part two is the awesome conclusion. In part one, our Savior was born into the world, but we know he didn't stay here for very long. He died on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and then he rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven. And he gave us the Holy Spirit in the meantime as a gift as we await the day when he will come again. Jesus came as Emmanuel, God with us, but his time on earth was only a partial fulfillment of that promise. His first coming was the assurance of another coming. And thankfully, the Bible reveals what will happen after that second coming, what we have to look forward to. And Brother Don's going to read for us what that promise is from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Thank you, Don. That's incredible. That's an amazing promise that God has given us. It's, it's like we're, we're eating a New Testament sandwich today, you know, beginning with Matthew the beginning of Matthew to the end of Revelation. And from beginning to end, it's all about Jesus. And these words are trustworthy and true. These words that Don just read, it's the fulfillment of the promise the angel declared to Joseph, the promise of God with us. And what a powerful promise that is, that through faith, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, that we will one day see the fulfillment of our deepest need and our greatest hope that we will dwell with God and know him face to face, that he himself, that God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. 
Death will be no more. Crying will be no more. Pain will be no more. We will be in the fullness of his joy. There will be a day very, very soon when Jesus will make all things new. All things new. No one else has the power or authority to declare such good news, to offer such hope. Only God has the power to do something like this. Even the most brilliant human minds could not solve the God-sized issues, the impossible issues we face in this broken world, but God can, and he has, and he will. Where is your hope? Do you have any hope right now? What we just read, God himself says, is trustworthy and true. God has given us a promise. And Christmas is the preview of that promise. That promise of God with us. Us not being alone. Us not living in this hopeless state. There's an unfinished part to this Christmas story. And that part will be ending soon. And what a glorious end that will be. Is your hope in life in the person and work of Jesus Christ? If it is, you have a hope that God himself has authored. It is beyond anything we can imagine. And he offers us that hope through Jesus Christ, through faith in him. That's the key. That's the difference. Is your hope in Jesus? If it is not, God is inviting you to place your hope in him today. That's the greatest Christmas gift you could ever receive. To repent of your sin to receive him as your Lord and Savior, to have the hope that we just read about. That's why Jesus came. Because of sin, we've been separated from God, whom our souls need communion with the most. Because of our sin, we could never reach up to God or reach out to God. We're helpless to save ourselves but that's why we can celebrate Christmas because God reached down. He became one of us. God came near to make oneness with him possible again because of this baby that was born in the manger that day. God is the greatest being in existence and He's the author and creator of life, the only source of truth and purpose and joy and fulfillment and hope. So what is the greatest gift he could ever give us? It's the gift of himself. And that's what Christmas is all about. Some say one of the hardest parts about this shutdown is the feeling that we don't really have much to look forward to anymore. Well, Christmas is the celebration that we do. We have a lot to look forward to. We have an eternity to look forward to. It's the celebration of Jesus. Part one, it's the celebration of this prelude, of this unfinished story, and an amazing, amazing ending that story has. He is our hope, brothers and sisters, both for now and for the age to come. And his hope is real. His hope is overcome all that we will face in this world. If you've already placed your hope in Jesus, let's be thankful for the hope that we have. And if you have not yet, God is inviting you to place your hope in him today. Let's bow our heads together.
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new.